One of the absolute highlights of my career was demonstrating my craft at this year's League of New Hampshire Craftsmen's Annual Fair at Sunapee. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here virtually with all of you and to address what is probably the underlying question, when and how did I get into this craft career anyway? Well, as luck would have it, in April of 2014, I was to be Exeter Fine Crafts Artist of the Month and was interviewed about this very subject by area arts writer Vandy Duffy for the Portsmouth Herald. She produced an article called Honing a Craft, A Trip Off the Beaten Path Brings Cynthia Ellis into Creative Role. Her writing is wonderful and sums it up beautifully, so I'll use some of it as the soundtrack for a slideshow of my work. But first, here's a short video sampling of what it is I actually do. I created this last year for the League's interrupted annual Craftsman's Fair that didn't happen at Sunapee. It's called The Magnificent Magnadot. Hi there, I'm Cynthia Ellis. I'm a New Hampshire native and a juried member of the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen since 2010 in the category of wood objects. Um, I started making wood objects a lot earlier in 1978. Just after I graduated college in San Francisco, I became a street artist in Berkeley um, over on Telegraph Avenue. And I made things at that time that I needed. And one of the things I really needed was a way to get my pot holder out of the junk drawer and somewhere accessible. So I made this little gizmo that I call a magna dot. It goes on the fridge and the pot holder is very useful when it's handy. So um, I made those and people liked them and so I made more and people said, oh, that looks a lot like a chess pawn, which kind of inspired me to make a chess set. And so I did that. But making chess sets was not the kind of product most people could afford to purchase, so I made lots of magna dots. So that's the way I still make my magna dots, um, but they keep having new uses popping up. Quilters use them to lift the rotary blades off their cutters. I didn't even know what a rotary blade was until I started selling my tools at quilt shows. But at any rate, the newest um, use is to hang your, your face mask on in between outings. I started making face masks as well, and I now have many of them. And so I always keep a clean one on the fridge so that I don't have to go hunting for it when I need to go out. So I hope you enjoy the virtual fair and stay safe. That was me in the shop. And this is me behind my lathe in my demo booth at this year's Craftsman's Fair at Sunapee. It was a challenge to fill the space, but at the front, beside my workbench, I posted that newspaper article, which began my story like this. Many artistic journeys begin by having a teacher hang up a childhood drawing or by taking a class. But picture this, a 25-year-old woman traveling across the country in her Volkswagen bug. It's the mid-1970s. She has left New England and is on her way to California to meet some friends for lunch and then return home. The trip is a lark. On her way, she meets a young man from San Francisco. He is part of the art scene there. They part ways, but in San Francisco, she meets him again. A California lunch is no longer her goal. 
the art scene calls to her. She stays in California and marries the San Francisco street artist. Sounds like something out of a movie, right? To be clear, it wasn't so much a lark as a walkabout or driveabout looking for inspiration. As a kid, apparently my mantra was, I'd rather do it myself. I had some powerfully independent and creative role models. My dad had extensive carpentry skills, was an accomplished electrical engineer, and following his brief Navy career, an avid sailor. My mom had been a Powers fashion model in her late teens, had a radio show, and then the first TV talk show in Portland directed toward women called Viewpoint with Binnie Ellis. She was also a painter and enjoyed the art of craft. So that drive cross country was my pathway. And once I'd finished with college at San Francisco State University in 1978, taking a woodworking class in my last semester, dad sent me a $500 congratulations gift, which I put to good use on secondhand tools, a three-wheeled bandsaw, a drill press, belt sander, and a lathe. Then I confiscated the dining room to make my wooden goodies and followed my silversmith partner onto Telegraph Avenue as a new Berkeley street artist. My creative principle was find a need and fill it. Keeping my hair out of the machinery was first up, so I made two-prong hairpins. Then bandsaw pocket boxes followed with simple and convenient toothpick hinges. Tangram puzzles were a simple toy to make on the bandsaw that offered creative solutions, and my char curvy character puzzles required a jigsaw and a bit more skill to cut. Having my first child inspired names on wheels, and the jigsaw really got a workout making holiday ornaments with crystal prism accents. Finally, my kitchen collection included my last bandsaw-focused item, which was a set of food-shaped cutting boards made of bird's-eye maple with stained edges and a natural wood and dowel rack to stand them up together. At this point, I'd had enough working at the bandsaw with headphones on to monitor the baby. He'd cry, I'd dust off, run upstairs, rock him back to sleep, go back to the shop, suit up again, and repeat. It got old fast, so we swapped crafts. Abe became a woodworker, turning pens. I became a jeweler, anodizing niobium, in a fashion similar to the popular line made by Haleyashi at the time. It was good to work on a clean porch close to the baby. I enjoyed it, despite the conflict with my practical nature. And it was fun to sell to San Francisco tourists by aquatic park, even to bring the now two kids along sometimes. But eventually, we moved out of the city, and by then, Abe needed help. So I did his prep and finish work, but also made my own line of pens, my own way. Remember? Childhood mantra. Turns out that college class gave me no hands-on lathe instruction, so I got the basics from Abe and learned the rest through trial and error. One error, in fact, demonstrates my creative process and relates to my magna dot. I'd been turning a lovely curving pen handle when I cut too deeply on one end and ruined it. Not wanting to waste the effort, I saved the good part and pondered, soon realizing it might look nice on the fridge, beside the dot and pot holder, and holding a flower blossom. We'll just flatten the backside, add a couple of magnets, maybe plug it up to hold water, or better yet, get a glass vial, a test tube maybe. I'd have to drill a bigger hole through the woodstock to allow passage, and turning it on the pen mandrel would need larger bushings, but I could find some from another project or jig them out of wood myself. I'd have to allow for changing the vial, though, if it ever broke and to keep it from dropping out at random. Maybe use a cutting of sticky back Velcro to give it a friction fit. Well, that did the trick. I now could offer grandmothers a special place to put that adorable dandelion offered so sweetly by their precious little ones while simultaneously providing a way to magnetically hold up a grocery list, a recipe, or the latest finger painting or photo. In fact, I then designed a collared fridge pen that could also rest loosely through that same vase body replacing the vial and giving me a sweet trio of fridge items perfect to solve multiple kitchen issues that is, until stainless steel refrigerators became all the rage and were decidedly magnet-unfriendly. 
but regardless of their own appliances, my customers are entertained by my display of these items on an actual fridge door. An inquiry from one craft fair customer in 2005 started a major redirect in the focus of my craft. She mistook one of my turned hairpins for a laying tool. I was unfamiliar with the terms, so she coached me on the nuances and hired me to provide them for her local needlepoint store. I also learned that tools like this were versatile, known by different names, and used for different purposes. That was my first inkling of the potential to be found in turning tools for the fiber arts. A short two years later, a garage fire disrupted work in the shop, but it led me to another key creation. In the backyard setup under the craft fair Easy Up, I took the blade and cover from a dismantled ordinary seam ripper bought at Walmart and fashioned a turned wooden handle. I figured a way to install the blade using a toothpick, rubber band, and glue and offered it for sale that fall on the avenue. Shoppers loved it instantly. Come September of 2008, with both kids out of the nest and mom's subtle plea for help with dad's Alzheimer's a concern, I returned to my roots, relieved to see dad not yet horribly impaired. In fact, it was great to find their happy marriage still intact. His workshop hadn't been used in years. It was easy to install the tools I brought with me and work whenever time allowed. The very next month, I attended a local quilt show as a first-time vendor, which was very encouraging. My second appearance six months later at the prestigious MQX show in Manchester was even more auspicious. There, near the end of the show, Mark Lipinski visited my booth to find out what the hubbub was all about. He was a fabric vendor, quilting instructor, and the editor of Quilter's Home magazine, and his students had been showing up in droves with my seam rippers in hand. He bought one and a few months later contacted me for permission to write about me in his October 2009 issue. That was a thrill and gave a serious boost to my online business, but I had a feeling I wouldn't be on the crest of that wave for long. In 2010, I began the process of becoming a juried member in the historic League of New Hampshire Craftsmen. I was pretty nervous about the process and took great care to write thoughtful responses to the questionnaire. One of my jurors was Peter Bloch, renowned lamp turner. Given that I was accepted in my first attempt, I guess I was doing something right. One of those somethings was to listen to my customers. My popular scissor pendant was a direct result of Pat's request. An elderly MQX customer, her scissors were always on the wrong side of the room. Could I help? After some thought and sleep, a solution came to me. Prototype testing revealed gravity alone was insufficient, so again a magnet was added. And again, my idea was put into print. More magazines inquired about my tools, which I gladly shared, but shouldn't have been surprised a few years later to learn a Seam Ripper project kit from China had appeared in the pages of every woodturner's catalog. Granted, they're only categorically similar, but that was the sound of the wave crashing. Which isn't to say kits don't have a place in a woodturner's repertoire. They did in mine. So my advice to new turners, go ahead and cut your teeth on the kits, but strive for some originality. Look for ways to create something uniquely yours. Try to think outside the box. These materials can support other designs. Utilize the parts and pieces of those kits in ways for which they weren't intended. That's how I achieved my rollerball desk pen and stand, and many other items. On Christmas Day of 2012, my second parent passed away, and one year later I was flying to this enormous quilters conference known as Road to California, with my whole display in a footlocker. The atmosphere of a quilt show, especially one of this size and caliber, with hundreds of quilts in competition and hundreds of vendors, is literally awesome. Imagine the competition alone is something special when the best in show award is $6,000. To be surrounded by evidence of such dedicated skill and creativity and to think my tools may have played a small part in producing any of that is very gratifying indeed. At least 40,000 attendees may have seen my work and I came back to New Hampshire greatly inspired. But my hands had other plans. Severe basal joint arthritis put me out of commission for the last half of 2014. 
which coincided with the demise of my preferred woodstock provider, Rutland Plywood Corporation. Diamondwood was their trade name given to this proprietary and exemplary dyed birchwood laminate. A disastrous fire demolished their entire facility in Vermont two weeks after the annual fair concluded in 2014 and two months before my first thumb surgery. They decided not to rebuild and any imitations of their stellar product have proven paltry at best. These were certainly discouraging developments, but only on the surface. I'd cultivated a habit of looking for the silver lining and found it rather quickly. In 2016, when I asked promoter Liz Frederick what new product her attendees would want, she promptly answered, something with a magnet. Well, that was right up my alley. Took a split second to see the application. With diamond wood reduced to what was left in my shop, I'd brought natural domestic hardwoods back. Any exotic look would consist of a small nugget of that precious commodity, bracketed by maple, walnut, or cherry. Joining segments required reinforcement with dowel pins, and that process, the way I do it anyway, leaves a tiny hole on the top of each ripper handle, perfectly poised to receive a tiny but super strong magnet. This hybrid result so pleased me I decided every ripper deserved a magnet, even those made only of common maple. And my newest half Flat rippers allowed for do-it-yourself blade replacement rather than waiting days and paying postage for my free reblading service to do the job. About three years later, I brought my work to Quilt Week in Paducah, the American Quilters Society heartland. Attendance here rivals that at Road to California, and the phenomenal display of raw talent is staggering. I was disappointed to see another tool booth with simply cylindrical turnings mounted onto kit components, but no matter, the quilting on display nearby my booth was exquisite. I'll share some of it and tell you that the public's praise of my work was just as gratifying as the cash they put on the barrel. Particular favorites included my magnetic pin cups, some with diamond wood accents, but the one pictured here is made of spalted maple, a fancy word for rotting. Also popular was the hefty edge presser tool for English paper pieced quilting. The half flat ripper, of course, is everybody's favorite. And also the hybrid magnetic scissor pendants found many happy homes. Even a few fridge vases attracted attention. My revolutionary magnetic needle threaders were also well received. Invented in 2018, they drew me into the U.S. patent process, as well as a wonderful bakery breakfast interview in Portsmouth the next year with Shintaro Sam Asano, inventor of the portable fax machine. My most professional seamstress customer, Janeth, and most mature customer, Bernice, age 98, are also both huge fans. This assortment of my popular tools for knitters and rug hookers has evolved over the years. And another musical moment, watching my chained piece cutter fast at work. Remember Road to California? Their online pandemic production, It's So Road, had me a virtual guest talking about my tools, where I also unveiled my first ever quilt, made of fun leftover mask fabric, for my first ever grandchild, Zena, born five weeks later. I just met her last month. Gotta say, making a quilt is really hard to do, but in the making of it, I got to experience directly the usefulness of all my sewing tools. <laughs> and watching my grandchild enjoy it made all the effort worthwhile. Okay, looks like I sold out. Thanks for watching. What's next? See you at next year's fair.